the fact that Meta has decided to go, uh, what do we call it, open source or open or available or whatever, but Llama is is a tremendous tool. I, I as, a, as an educator myself, I'm grateful. I was I'm, I'm emeritus at CUNY, but now I'm at SUNY Stony Brook. And it's because of Llama that universities can run models yeah. and learn from them and build things. And it struck me, and I've said this often, that I think that the meta strategy, your strategy here on Llama uh, and, and company, is uh, a spoiler for much of the industry part, but an enabler for tremendous open development, uh, whether it's academic or entrepreneurial. And so I'd love to hear from the horse's mouth here, what's the strategy behind uh, opening up Llama in the way that you've done? Okay, it's a spoiler for exactly three companies. Yeah, exa well, exactly, yes. Okay, <laughs> it's, an, it's an enabler for thousands of companies. Yes. Um, so... So obviously, you know, from a pure ethical point of view, it's obviously the right thing to do, right? Yeah. You're, I mean, Lama, uh, Lama 2, the release of Lama 2 in, in you know, qualified open source uh, uh, has basically completely jump-started the, the uh, AI ecosystem, uh, you know, not just in industry and, and startups, but, but also in academia, as you, were, as you were saying, right? I mean, academia basically doesn't have the means to train their own... Uh, uh, you know, foundation model at the same level as uh, as, as companies, and so they they, they rely on uh, this kind of uh, open source platforms to be able to make contributions to uh, to AI research, and that's kind of one of the main reasons uh, for uh, for Meta to actually release those those those, uh, those foundation models in open source is to enable innovation, faster innovation, and the question is not whether. You know, this or that company is three months ahead of the other, which is really the case right now. I mean, uh, the question is, do we have the capabilities in the AI systems that we have at the moment to uh, enable the, the products we want to build? And the answer is no. Um, the product that Meta wants to build ultimately is an AI assistant that, or maybe a collection of AI assistants that is with us at all times, maybe lives in our smart glasses, right, that, that we can talk to. Uh, maybe it displays information, you know, in the in the uh, the lens, um, and 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 everything. And um, and for those things to be maximally useful, they would need to have human level intelligence. Now, we know that moving towards human level intelligence is not going. So first of all, it's not going to be an event. There's not going to be like a day where we don't have AGI and a day after which we have AGI. It's just not. <laughs> Not going to happen this way. Okay. I'll buy you the drinks if that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I should be buying you the drinks because I'm it's not happening. But um, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen this way, right? No. Um, uh, so the, the, the question really um, uh, w would be, um, you know, how, how, how do we make faster, fastest possible progress towards uh, human level intelligence, and since it's one of the you know biggest scientific and technological challenge uh, that we've faced, uh, we need contributions from anywhere in the world. There's good ideas that can come up from anywhere in the world, and we've seen an example with DeepSeek recently, right? Which surprised everybody in Silicon Valley. Didn't surprise many of us in the open source world that much, right? I mean, that's the point. It's sort of validation of the whole idea of open source. Um, mm. And so, you know, good ideas can come from anywhere. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas, uh, except people who have like uh, an incredibly inflated superiority com uh, <laughs> complex. Not, not that we're talking okay. about anybody in particular, right? No, no, we're not talking about anybody in particular. <laughs> um, but it's a high concentration of those people in certain areas of the country. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, you know, um, and, and of course, they have a vested interest in sort of kind of dif disseminating this idea that they, that, you know, somehow uh, they, they're better than everybody else. So, uh, you know, I think it's still uh, like a major scientific challenge and uh, we need uh, everybody to contribute. So the best way we know how to do this in the context of academic research is you publish your research, you mm -hmm. publish your code in open source um, uh, as much as you can, and you get people to contribute. And I think the, the history of AI over the last dozen years really shows that I mean, the, the progress has been fast because people were sharing uh, code and, and scientific information. And some, you know, a few uh, players in the space started climbing up over the last 
three years um, because they need to generate revenue from the technology. Now, at Meta, we don't generate revenue from the technology itself. We generate mm -hmm. revenue from ads, and those ads rely on the quality of products that we built on top of the technology. And, you know, they rely on, you know, the network effect of the social networks and or past, you know, or, or, or uh, a conduit to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the people and the users. And so the fact that we distribute our technology doesn't hurt us commercially. In fact, mm -hmm. it helps us. Right. Right. You, you mentioned the topic of wearables and glasses, and that, of course, always sparks my attention. I, I had the opportunity to check out uh, Google's Project Astra glasses last December, uh -huh. and it stuck with me ever since The uh, and, and really kind of solidified my view of that being a really wonderful next step for contextualizing the world. The line that I've been able to draw in talking with you between where we are now and where we're going potentially is not only the context that that experience gives the wearer, but for you, for, for Meta and for those creating these systems, smart glasses out in the real world, taking in information on how humans live and operate in our physical world could be right. a really good kind of uh, source of knowledge to pull from for what you were talking about earlier. Am I on the right track or is that just one piece, one very small piece of the puzzle? Well, it's a, it's, it's a piece, <laughs> uh, yeah. an important piece. But yeah, I mean, the idea that you have an assistant with, with you at all times that sees what you see, hears what you hear, um, if you let it, obviously. If you let and, it, for sure. You know, is, is your, but, but to some extent, is your, your confident and can help you, you know, as perhaps even better than uh, how a human assistant could, could help you. Uh, mm. I mean, that, that's certainly a, an important vision. In fact, the vision yeah. is that, you won't have a single assistant. You will have like a whole staff of uh, intelligent virtual assistant uh, working around with you. It's like all of us would be the would be a boss. Okay, I mean, people feel threatened. Uh, some people feel threatened by the fact that machines would be smarter than us, but um, but we should feel empowered by it. I mean, they, they're going to they're going to be working for us. You know, I don't know about you, but um, you know, as a as a scientist or as a manager in industry. The best thing that can happen to you is you hire students or or engineers or people working for you that are smarter than you. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the that's a, uh, that's the ideal situation, and you shouldn't feel threatened by that. You should feel empowered by it. So, mm -hmm. so I think that's the the future we should envision: um, smart collection of assistants that you know help you in your daily lives. Maybe smarter than you. You give them a task, they accomplish it perhaps better than you, and that's great. Um, mm -hmm. Now. That, that connects to another point I wanted to make, uh, you know, related to the previous question, which is about open source, which is that um, in that future, most of our interactions with the digital world will be mediated by AI, AI systems. Okay. Uh, and that's why, you know, Google is a little frantic right now because they, 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 they know that nobody is going to go to a search engine anymore, right? Um, we ju you're just going to talk to your AI assistant. So they, they're trying to experiment with this, you know, within, within Google. Um, that's going to be through glasses. So they realize they probably have to build those. You know, Again. They realized this several years ago. Mm -hmm. So we have a bit of a head start. But, um, uh, but that, that's really what's going to happen. We're going to have those AI assistants with us at all times. And, um, and we're not going to, and, and they, they're going to mediate all of our uh, information diet. Now, if you think about this, um, if you are a citizen anywhere in the world, uh, you do not want your information diet to come from AI assistant built by a handful of companies on the west coast of the US or China. You want a high diversity of AI assistant that first of all speaks your own language, um, you know, whether it's a obscure dialect or, or local language. Um, Second of all, understand your culture, your value system, mm -hmm. uh, your biases, whatever they are. And so we need a high diversity of such assistance for the same reason we need a high diversity of, uh, of the press, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm re I realize I'm talking to a, a journalism professor here. But, uh, <laughs> so, but like, am I, am I right? <laughs> um, uh, amen. In fact, I think that's, that's what I celebrate 
is what the internet and next AI can do is to tear down the structure of mass media and open up media once again at a human level. AI lets us be more human, I hope. Hmm. I hope too. Um, so the only way we can achieve this with current technology is if the, the people building those assistants with cultural diversity and everything um, have access to powerful open source uh, foundation models because they're not going to have the resources to train their own models, right? We need models that speak all the languages in the world, um, understand all the value system and have all the biases that you can imagine in terms of, you know, culture, political biases, whatever you want. And so there's going to be thousands of those that we're going to have to choose from. And they're going to be built by small shops uh, everywhere around the world. And they're going to have to be built on top of uh, foundation models trained by, you know, a large company like Meta or maybe an international consortium that, you know, trains those, uh, those foundation models. The, the, the picture I see, the evolution of the, the market that I see um, is similar to what happened with the software infrastructure of the internet in the late 90s or, or the early 2000s, where, you know, in the early days of the internet, you had, you know, Sun Microsystem, Microsoft, HP, IBM, and a few others kind of pushing to provide the hardware and software infrastructure of the internet, you know, their own version of Unix or whatever, or Windows NT and their own web server and their own, you know, racks and blah, blah, blah. All of this got completely wiped out by Linux and commodity hardware, right? And the reason it got wiped out is because, you know, running, you know, Linux is a platform software. It's, it's, it's more portable, more reliable, more secure, more cheaper, you know, everything. And so, you know, Google was one of the first to, to do this, build the infrastructure on commodity hardware and open source operating system. Meta, of course, did exactly the same thing. And everybody is doing it now, even Microsoft. Uh, so um, I think it's, there's going to be a similar uh, pressure from the, the market to make those, uh, you know, AI foundation models uh, open and free um, because it's an infrastructure. Like, uh, like the infrastructure of the internet.